Matt Zipchin. Matt is the president of Efficiency Capital. He has over two decades of experience in green building consulting, renewable energy, sustainable de development, and energy efficiency financing. He's known for his work at the forefront of groundbreaking projects. Matt was the driving force behind the launch of SolarShare, a renewable energy cooperative, and now he leads innovation at Efficiency Capital. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Beata, and welcome back, everyone, uh, or welcome if this is your first day. Um, I'm here, obviously, to talk about funding and financing strategies, so funding your projects. Uh, so just a brief table of contents, even though there's a lot of good content in here, uh, I'm kind of going to give you a framework of the different types of capital and funding sources you can look at when looking at your project. I'm going to go through some of those sources, but uh, not all of them, because there are quite a number of different sources out there. And then I'm going to kind of discuss the uh, level of due diligence and effort required for the different types, and then you know, how you can think about it from um, kind of stacking different sources together to really get the best uh, value out of your project. Next slide, please. So in terms of sources of capital, uh, we've kind of split the world into traditional versus highly specialized sources. So your traditional sources of capital is, of course, your equity, which is really your reserves, um, uh, any utility incentives, which is what you should be looking at first for your project anyway, uh, traditional loans or equipment leases, and then you have your funding programs, which uh, come usually from government sources uh, or not-for-profit not, not sources. On the specialized side, so over the last... Um, Oh, I, I don't want to put a timeline on it, but recently we've seen the rise of all of these specialized uh, funding sources that are really focused on energy efficiency or low carbon or net zero, and they're innovative kind of market mechanisms to, um, to supply different types of funding for different types of projects. So going from right to left, we have on-bill financing which uh, you see a lot more of in the States. We're starting to see more of it here in, in Canada, uh, starting to pick up. Um, we are working on a couple projects where we're looking at some on-bill financing. And what that is, is that it's a mechanism to pay for you know, the monthly payments of your uh, retrofit basically on the utility bill itself. Uh, this can be really helpful from a collections point of view, can be really helpful uh, in a, um, a, a, a commercial setting where your, your tenants are paying for, uh, you know, the, the, the utilities or any related costs on the actual utility bill. Uh, this is really just a way to facilitate payment. Um, in terms of PACE or local improvement charge, PACE is kind of more the, the American term, and I, I mentioned it in my presentation yesterday. So these are programs that are set up usually by municipalities. Um, and what it is, is that it actually uh, allows you to get low interest loans and to do your retrofit. And the repayment of that is actually tied to the property tax bill. So as I mentioned yesterday, uh, people buy and sell their homes or their buildings every five to seven years. If you have a retrofit that you know has a 15 year uh, payment horizon or a term, uh, you, know, you often say, well, why would I do this? I'm only gonna enjoy half the benefits while I'm here. So the idea is that uh, you could still enjoy the benefits and you know not take on the full liability because it sits in 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 on on the tax bill. And City of Toronto has a couple programs. You'd have to check with your municipality specifically if they've uh, if they've launched any uh, pace or or local improvement charge financing. Uh, there's also funding in place specifically for municipalities to do this. So some of the um, the low carbon economy fund coming out of uh, the federal government. Um, or even I believe some of the FCM uh, funds municipalities to, to, to help launch their own programs. Really great program, uh, but again, check, check um, you know, your local municipality. And then finally, we have what I would call like third-party uh, investors or third-party lenders uh, with a savings-backed arrangement. So historically, that's been energy performance contracting, uh, which, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, comes out of the world of ESCOs, energy service companies where you would have a building owner, uh, uh, an energy service company and a lender, and the energy service company would do turnkey uh, retrofit guarantee savings. The lender would uh, lend it to the building owner against that guarantee. And then if there's any savings missing uh, in any of the length of the project, the building owner would uh, recoup against the, uh, the ESCO's guarantee. 
in that model, um, it's still uh, very much a, an on balance sheet model. So it's, it is a liability and the building owner is on the hook for the principal and interest, regardless of whether the savings appear, but they can reclaim uh, missed savings against the guarantee. So that's what we call energy performance contracting. And then more recently, we've seen the next kind of innovation or iteration of um, energy performance contracting, which is which is pure kind of shared savings or service-based agreements. So this is energy as a service, efficiency as a service, lighting as a service, heating and cooling as a service. Uh, you can do many things as a service. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, it's kind of the next evolution of energy performance contracting and it is full transference of risk uh, and, and basically the, the service partner and this is something efficiency capital does uh, where you know we put the uh, money in to do all the upgrades and we manage those upgrades uh, throughout time and our actual payment is not a principal and interest payment it's a service payment and it can fluctuate based on the level of service so if we are getting paid out of energy savings and there are no energy savings you know we take a zero payment which is different than the performance contracting model where um, you know it's it's a principal and interest payment regardless so a little bit of a more risk transferent and that has some balance sheet benefits, which I'll talk about um, in a little bit. Next slide, please. So as I said, the very first thing you need to look at when you start your retrofit project, at least from the business case and the funding side is what utility incentives are available in the marketplace. Uh, they change every year, so you need to stay on top of it. But this is an area where you can really lean into your service providers, uh, your energy engineers, your, your contractors, because they're, they tend to be very well aware. This is their core business, and they can also help manage um, the process of applying. So, you know, your, your two main ones are Enbridge or, or Union Gas um, on the gas side. So they have programs specifically for multi-residential, and these are tend to be more prescriptive um, uh, programs. So what I mean by prescriptive is they say, if you change out, you know, this boiler to increase efficiency by this much, we will give you this many dollars per unit. So prescriptive is saying we're prescribing a dollar amount for a very specific equipment based measure. Uh, and those are, you know, historically have been around for decades. Uh, but again, they do change year by year. The Enbridge incentives also has an affordable housing component. So they still have the prescriptive component. But if you're an affordable housing provider, then you also have an ability to get some uh, funding for studies and the planning, so your energy audits and things like that. Uh, and then there are um, additional kind of top up benefits that I would say so, you know, you can get up to $100,000 that's directly there to reduce the payback of your project, which is separate from the prescriptive incentives. And then there's also some free and sweet measures that they offer, so like shower heads and, and, and heat reflector panels. Next slide, please. And then on the electricity side, uh, again, you know, same, same, same approach with your gas incentives, work through your service provider. Uh, the electricity side, of course, focuses on electrical measures. So that tends to be a lot of light, but it also can, can be uh, uh, other things like pumps and motors. And then again, this is kind of highly prescriptive. You know, it says, you know, by, based on a certain type of lighting, we will give you X dollars per kilowatt reduced of demand or, you know, five cents a kilowatt hour of your first year electricity savings. Uh, and they split that based on, you know, whether it's a lighting or, or, or non-lighting measure on the electricity side. Uh, again, similar to the gas incentives, they have free in suite uh, uh, programs available. So LED light bulbs, power bars with timers, efficiency shower heads and aerators and such. And then um, especially on the, on the social housing side, there is money available for uh, audits, um, whether it's the energy audit and tenant surveys and, and so forth. So yeah, that's just a quick review. We have uh, more details, uh, you, um, which I'll touch on later. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving away from the in incentives, everyone, again, you work through your service provider, the utility incentives, they're gonna maximize them for you, or they should. Uh, and you know that will reduce your total capital costs of the project. So you have your reduced capital costs and you say, now, how do we fund this? You know, the, the first thing you look at and the easiest thing to look at is your, your, your reserves, your equity contribution. Can you do this yourself? Do you want to do this yourself? Um, and how do you evaluate that? How do you evaluate whether you should use your own capital or not? Well, there's a couple, um, a couple trigger events that I think I mentioned in, in yesterday's presentation. So one of the first things you want to look at is what is your capital plan and does your capital plan make sense? And, kind of what is end of life in the next five years. Uh, you can kind of see in the 
on the right hand side of my slide here on, on the table this was, this was from our wood wood green project where we looked at a bunch of different measures and, and we evaluated you can see on the very far right it says ee for energy efficiency eol for end of life or oc for occupant comfort so we were looking at all the measures possible um and then we were kind of ranking them on that anything that was end of life was going to be required to be replaced anyway and so from a um you know a business case point of view it made sense to include that capital investment in in, in the project because it, it, it was money that was earmarked for spending um and then the issues you kind of have to manage around that though is is you know how is your balance sheet being managed and 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 do you have any regulatory oversights that you have to get approval for how much you're going to contribute uh and then how are you actually going to replenish your reserve so uh what i mean by that is um the the second graph there i think is a really good example this is again from woodgreen where we looked at the deferred liabilities or well you know the liabilities over the next 30 years uh and we said okay you know if we can you know move around depending on you know change where which day was well, sorry which years those capital expenditures happened on uh it can really change the the end of the end state of the reserve so you know if you're saving to replace a boiler in year five but now you're using external uh funding to replace that boiler you can redo your capital plan and now you're saving to replace that boiler in year 20 fundamentally changes how much you have to put away each month to save for that boiler. And so this is kind of, again, one of those reserve fund benefits that often doesn't get calculated in the business case analysis. The other piece of equity you need to consider is most of the funding projects, uh, programs out there require 20, 25% equity contribution. So if you're not working with a third party developer like efficiency capital or or you know, somebody else in the ecosystem, then you're gonna to have to come up with that equity contribution yourself. So again, this is often where you look to your reserves. Next slide, please. So traditional loans and leases, I think most people are familiar with you know, mortgage financing on their building or traditional equipment leases. Uh, what we've seen over the last five years is some of the greening of, uh, of, of the kind of the mortgage offerings from certain of the institutions. So they might be willing to lend more if you're willing to commit to certain energy efficiency measures, but this all generally gets wrapped up into your into your mortgage financing package. Uh, so when you're thinking about okay well is this appropriate for me, a lot really kind of depends on are you are you in a period of refinancing anyway, so there's kind of again a trigger event that we talked about yesterday, and then also. It is a debt instrument, so it, it will require a borrowing bylaw. If you're in a, in a co-op or a condo, if, if you're a social housing provider, not for profit, you probably need approval from your, uh, your municipal administrator. Uh, and then also there's no risk transference. So again, traditional loan or lease, you're on the hook for the performance of, of that, that equipment or that measure. As we move more towards the, the other uh, funding opportunities like saving backs arrangements, you'll see the, the more of risk transference. So one of the evaluations of, of the loan and lease is not just a financial evaluation, but it is an evaluation of what kind of risk does your organization want to take on. Again, I think I measure, uh, mentioned yesterday, you know, most property owners or managers have at least one story in the past where they've tried a new technology or a new system and uh, was disappointed with their results. Well, that kind of risk is on you in, in a traditional debt instrument environment. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a, a, a couple examples of, uh, of some traditional loans that, that, I, that have been greened. So TD, um, HSBC uh, have, you know, their, you know, traditional, uh, TD is a traditional loan, uh, but, you know, they are willing to do uh, specifically for renewable energy projects. HSBC is uh, green equipment financing and green loans. Uh, Van City uh, or VCIB is, uh, is a little bit different. And they have a bit more of a, a specialized program. Uh, they have a really unique project finance team within the bank, which is not often what you see. Banks tend to not really do a lot of project finance. Uh, and you'll hear more from uh, Van City in the panel. Uh, but when you're trying to develop either your affordable housing project at the, at the actual building scale or a retrofit within, uh, Van City has the, uh, the capacity to help you with both or either and a really great expert team um, to uh, develop a specific, you know, financing uh, solution for your, your project. Next slide, please. So now we're moving into program specific funding. So 
Uh, as I said, policy has really uh, focused on affordability in, in the last few years, but also on climate change and energy efficiency. So we've seen the rise of, of you know, specific government programs that are really there to help fund your project. So CMHC, well-known entity, of course, uh, they have two, um, two main uh, uh, products uh, under this one. There's a third one that, that is recently announced that I'll get to in another slide. And that's their preservation seed funding and their co-investment fund. And so again, great programs for um, if you want to get, get a grant for study. So again, that's energy audits, BCAs, things like that. And then they have uh, you know, some capital funding uh, available as well. In these, they look at really not just energy efficiency, but also the affordability and, and accessibility. I've seen these programs being used um, where the building owner is looking to either purchase a building, to redevelop a building, where the project is not just about energy efficiency retrofit, there's a larger play and the CMHC funding is really, really great for that. Um, and also their energy efficiency requirements um, are not quite as onerous as, um, as some of the other funders, but then of course you don't always get all the extra bells and whistles that the other funders come with as well. Next one is CMHC. Uh, uh, sorry, no, yeah, stay on that slide. Thank you. Uh, so next one is the, um, uh, sorry, the FCM. And uh, FCM, I mentioned yesterday as well, really, really great program. So this one really is just focused on energy efficiency projects. So again, not, not uh, you know, purchasing a new building, et cetera. Um, but the neat thing is, is that this is stackable with CMHC. So if you are looking at the preservation or co-investment fund, you can actually stack the FCM funding as well. And it's been designed that way. And they encourage you to look at stacking them both and how that works. You know, they're, they're there to hold your hand. So the FCM, um, again, another really great program. You, um, you can get a grant for planning. So you just heard in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentation how important it is to engage your tenants and engage them early and engage them multiple times. Well, both CMHC and FCM have, real, have, um, have acknowledged that the amount of early planning and communication and stakeholder engagement that you need to do is, is really important. So they've set it up so that you can get grants to actually do this planning. And you don't, you know, you have to commit to trying to get the project done, but you don't have to be at the point where your project's approved. So really great way to start your conversations and, and start those early. And then as you go from the plan, um, from uh, FCM actually has two planning stages. They have uh, a, a small grant for like tenant engagement, and things like that. And then they actually have a study grant for when you're doing your actual like ASHRAE level three audits, for example. And then you, they also have the capital funding which is you know, 80% of cost up to, up to 10 mil. And I believe um, I mentioned this yesterday too, really great aspect of the program is that they will turn anywhere from 25 to 50% of that loan into a grant, depending on the level of energy, uh, energy reductions achieved. Not only that, you can include non-energy um, measures in there. So again, if you have one measure, that's a million dollar measure and it achieves a 40% reduction, but then you've got another $4 million of capital costs in non-energy uh, upgrades. You can combine that, those together. You're still gonna get a 40% grant of your overall loan, including on the aspects um, uh, for your non-energy measures. So from a capital planning point of view, this is actually can be really, really powerful and a way to kind of reduce some of the burden on the equity contribution you have to make from your reserves. And then finally, I've, I've been an example of, of Toronto's Better Buildings Partnership. Uh, you'll see how we leverage this program in the Wood Green Project. Uh, this is um, highly specific to the City of Toronto. You'll have to check your municipalities to see if they have something similar. Uh, but here, um, basically, it is a low interest loan that goes up to 20 years and the, um, has to be paid back from the expected savings so that the net present value of the savings is greater than the net present value of the loan payments. This is also a really great program um, because it doesn't necessarily have to be secured against the building, which is a big barrier for a lot of building owners. I've included this one, uh, recognizing that there's a lot of you that are outside of the city of Toronto and are not gonna be able to take advantage of this, but I've included it because I think it's a really interesting case study of how it came to be. This program technically has been around for over two decades. And it originally started as a way to fund 
and, and it kind of an alternative funding mechanism purely for city of Toronto buildings. They didn't used to offer this to any external building owners. Um, and it was over the years that they saw this as a great funding mechanism for their own buildings that they started to expand it beyond the city of Toronto buildings themselves. They started with uh, not-for-profit uh, building owners and then have moved to really any type of building owner that is taking efficiency. So the reason why I include that is that it's an interesting pathway for having developed this type of funding program. So if there are any municipal providers on, on, on the call and you're thinking about, you know, how can we, you know, how can we help incentivize? Maybe this is a model that you can, you, you can look at. Next slide, please. Uh, so another uh, interesting program that's also fairly new, so not for housing providers, but I wanted to mention it because everyone's connected in, in, our, eco, in our ecosystem, and that's Infra Infrastructure Canada's Green and Inclusive Community Buildings. And so this is purely for kind of public or semi-public buildings that are there as part of the community infrastructure. So community centers, sports and rec facilities, cultural buildings, even food banks and greenhouses, for example, or you know, uh, food storage uh, infrastructure, and this is actually a direct funding program. So you know, there's the it's it's not a loan. It's we will help fund your project. It does require contribution. So again, thinking about you know whether you're getting that contribution from a third party uh, or you know, or from equity reserves yourself. Uh, but really, really interesting program. Uh, they have a continuous intake if your project is anywhere from 100,000 to 3 million. Uh, anything from 3 to 25, it's a scheduled intake. Uh, the intake is closed right now, but they, um, they are planning to open it up again. And here the study costs are not funded separately, but they can be capitalized in the, in, in the project itself. Uh, so again, if you know anyone who, who can take advantage of this project or wants to know more, please reach out. Next uh, slide, please. So this is um, a really interesting um, mortgage insurance product that CMHC just came out with in the last few months. So how this works is um, by taking out mortgage insurance, you can get certain benefits. You can um, you know, get a better loan to value. You can reduce your uh, debt coverage ratio. You can get a better amortization. Uh, and CMHC has come out, uh, again, with the public policy focus of affordability, accessibility, and efficiency. And they've come out with this point system, essentially. So you can see um, the, each, each of the measures, affordability, accessibility, and efficiency in the rel uh, respective colors. And then you have on your right there with the bar graph, the different ways that you can achieve the different levels of points. Uh, and then in the bottom left with the table, you can see that the higher number of points gives you access to better mortgage terms, essentially. So obviously affordability is a big piece. And um, another interesting aspect of this is how you can kind of choose your pathway. Uh, I'm looking at the second last bar there um, where, you know, you can basically do a 40% reduction in your, um, in your GHGs, achieve 100 points. Uh, so this is, you know, really powerful for whether you're a private sector building owner. Uh, this is purely for MERBs, so multi-unit residential. But if you're private sector, social housing is not on your agenda, but you still want to, you still want to take advantage of this program. You can do a deep, deep green retrofit. Uh, if you are a social housing provider, you can do a deep affordability retrofit. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're somewhere in the middle, you can have a little bit of both. Do some affordability. Do some some energy efficiency or, or low carbon stuff, as well as some accessibility stuff. This is also really critical because uh, accessibility legislation, uh, you know, the um, everyone has to basically start to make the buildings accessible. Uh, so this is a really great program to do so. Uh, in terms of the benefits, essentially you get lower mortgage payments depending on your, your higher points uh, that you score. Obviously there's a little bit of an insurance premium you have to pay, but the uh, the actual benefits once you, once you you know, pencil this out the math far outweigh those premium. Uh, I'm going to give you an example at the end of this presentation of how you could stack this for a really, uh, really powerful value proposition. Next slide, please. So now, um, kind of moving away from, um, I guess this is still program specific in, in that it's government, but this is kind of more of a a market mechanism based stuff and this is more for the uh, privately owned buildings so it won't necessarily apply to um, 
you know, this is more for commercial buildings. This won't necessarily apply to uh, social housing. Commercial buildings can be apartments that are commercially owned for profit. I wanted to include this because it's new and, and, and you know, uh, MERBs do include for profit apartments. So the Canadian Infrastructure came, Canada Infrastructure Bank came out with their, you know, commercial building retrofit program. Uh, and basically they said, we want to lend really cheap debt, anywhere from, you know, one to 3%. Uh, and I think that range depends on the depth of your carbon reductions. Uh, and we want to have long amortization periods. We really want to see deep retrofits. Uh, so they've created this program where they will lend 80% of the project value. However, uh, the minimum they will lend is $25 million. So if you are a building owner with a large portfolio, you can take advantage of this and they will lend the money directly to you. But they have also set up an aggregator program. So you can work with an aggregator uh, if your project is less than 25 million and the, uh, your aggregator will basically have created a special purpose vehicle that they can access this money and then help fund your project. The models of which they're doing the, the project funding through the aggregator uh, fall more on the savings backed arrangements, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Next slide, please. So savings backed arrangements, I, I, I spoke briefly about this on my first slide talking about uh, energy performance contract and you know energy as a service or efficiency as a service. But the idea is that you have a third party developer and investor or, th or funder who comes and, and develops the projects, um, funds it, main maintains the operating, um, you know, maintains the operations of them and make sure that you know, they, they operate according to spec and that savings are achieved. Uh, and they tend to be savings backed. So the idea being that uh, you know, we either guarantee or get paid out of the number of savings that we produce. Now, savings doesn't necessarily have to be energy savings. In the tradi traditional EPC, energy performance contracting uh, or ESCO model, it was energy savings. As we've moved to energy as a service, we've seen it have a variety of key performance indicators that you could have a kind of a savings backed arrangement on. So Again, it could be um, energy savings. It could be maintenance savings if you can quantify them. Uh, I've seen, you know, we recently responded to a couple of RFPs where we were using some of the um, KPIs that you see in, in large P3s, but now we've brought it down to a, a smaller scale. So the idea is that we're not just getting paid out of savings, but we're also, you know, we're, uh, our payment is based on other measures like uptime or response time, uh, or so there's some pain share, gain share. So we, you know, only make money if, if, if profits, uh, sorry, if the project achieves a certain amount, uh, or the revenues from the project are tied to the revenues of the building owner. So those kind of things you tend to see in, in larger projects, but it's really interesting, innovative space. And again, it is the full risk transference. You are basically no longer just looking for a service provider to execute your project. Now you're in the market for kind of a long-term partner in the infrastructure of your building. So from your organization's point of view, you, uh, your process is more of a partnership process than it is a traditional service procurement process. And so you have to kind of be aware of that difference and understand what that actually means to your organization. And again, happy to chat further about this if you wanted to follow up. Next slide. And uh, the last one that I mentioned um, was kind of community bonds. Uh, this is also another interesting um, uh, tool on the landscape, kind of recent in the last 10 years. Uh, and so this is kind of where do you, can, is there, are there alternative ways that you can fund your project? And especially on this equity side. So, you know, you look at, you know, all these great funding programs that require 20% equity contribution, you may not have that equity. You may not have it right away, but you expect to have it over time. You know, community bonds have been a way to raise that capital to fund your project when you have a really great mission and a community uh, to support you. So uh, I believe it was Tanya Sermon at the Center for Social Innovation that said, you know, community bonds is a way to turn your social capital into financial capital. And I, I've given the, the Center for Social Innovation example here because I think it's really neat. Uh, so for those who don't know, so Center for Social Innovation or CSI for short is a, um, um, it, it's like an incubator here in Toronto for social entrepreneurs and social ventures. And at first, the very first building that they had, they were just leasing space and then you know subletting it to 
small social entrepreneurs and, and then creating programming within their space. Uh, hugely popular um, and so much so that they started bursting at the seams in terms of needing space. And uh, so they, looked to, they were looking to purchase a building. So they approached the uh, city of Toronto and said, you know, from a public policy point of view, we're, we're, you know, we're achieving a lot of great objectives, incubating uh, social entrepreneurs, achieving social outcomes, you know, please help us create more space for them. So they secured a loan guarantee from the city of Toronto, um, which then allowed them to go and go to a, a private lender and get better terms on, on that borrowing. Um, they, um, you know, they basically were able to borrow a 75% um, levered mortgage on the future value of the pro of the property, so post retrofit, um, as opposed to 65% of the purchase price uh, on a valuation that's pre retrofit. So that was great, but they still needed to come up with $2 million in equity. You know, they, they managed to get this great, these great debt terms. So they issued um, an RSP eligible community bond and they raised their 2 million and they were able to um, purchase, uh, purchase that building and then pay their bondholders back. Their bondholders, I think at the time had a two or 3% interest rate. So really great way to come up with, with, with your with your equity and, and get a lot of buy-in from your community who will either be using the space or support the space. Uh, another example that I was a part of, which is solar share. So that was a renewable energy co-op. And the idea being that, you know, we wanted community ownership in our renewable energy project. So we launched a community bond, a solar bond, we called it also RSP eligible. And uh, I believe now it has over 2000 members and they've raised over 60, uh, well, they've raised and built over $65 million of community-owned solar projects across Ontario. So again, really interesting um, mechanism for fundraising if you have a strong community from which to fundraise from. And there are um, specific organizations on the landscape to actually help you directly with this, help you with your raise, help you manage the funds, help you, you know, disperse them, pay bondholders, uh, you know, their interest payments and issue their, their T5s, et cetera. Um, and happy to provide more information on that. Next slide, please. Okay, so what's required? Going from left to right is kind of the uh, increasing complexity. So utility incentives, as I said, you really don't have to do a lot if you rely on your service provider. They're experts in this. They have relationships with both Enbridge, IESO. They will apply for these incentives to have them approved based on you know, the project concept and then you know, secure the incentives once things are, are installed and they will manage that process for you. So from, a, from a, a complexity approval or due diligence point of view, very easy. Equity is also fairly easy from a, it's in your control. There's not a lot of uh, due diligence or application needed uh, other than your internal approvals process. You do, of course, need a business case if you're going to if you're going to um, get board approval to spend something that's not already in your reserve plan or your capital plan. Then, as you kind of go into the traditional loans, funding programs, you know, so traditional loans, you've got all your traditional security arrangements, your borrowing bylaw, um, whether or not you need a post retrofit appraisal. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of that yet. But other than the traditional borrowing process, again, you're not into a lot of complexity yet. As you now move into the funding programs, now you have to start doing uh, energy audits for sure to get do a baseline to compare how much you've improved. Um, you know, there's all these other non-energy benefits that you have to demonstrate you've, you've achieved. And sometimes you have to demonstrate those for a long period of time. So your organization has to have the capacity to do the monitoring and verification and, and, and just the reporting on that. And then as you move to savings back arrangement, you're now moving from, let's say, an ASHRAE level two audit, which is what's required for a lot of the uh, CMHC, FCM, City of Toronto programs. As you're moving into a, a kind of a third party investor savings back arrangement, um, because the third party investor is putting their capital in, they really need accurate energy savings estimates and, and, and kind of accurate cost estimates. So now we're moving from an ASHRAE level two to an ASHRAE level three. You're now dealing with uh, more complex service contracts. Uh, you're dealing with requirements around preventative maintenance, and there may be even key uh, parts of the program that now require behavior change. So now you have to put a attendant engagement program in place. And then finally, this other piece of equity, which I mentioned last, which was your community bonds. Community bonds, great, great source of capital, can be a really cheap source of capital for your equity. 
However, it does take a fair amount of energy to raise community bonds. Uh, you need a sales and marketing team to you know, go out and basically talk to your community, to sell them on it, to do the transaction, to manage those transactions. And so while there are organizations on the landscape there to help you, it does require you know, a certain capacity internally to even engage with them. So you know, again, as we've gotten from traditional on the left and fairly straightforward and easy, to more specialized with even greater benefits, there is an internal capacity cost. And one of the things that we find at Efficiency Capital is, you know, we solve for kind of three problems, our model, and I'll maybe speak about this briefly in the closing remarks. We provide 100% capital and we transfer all the risk because we get paid out of the performance, whether it's savings, maintenance, carbon, whatever. Uh, but the biggest barrier that we encounter is capacity. Even though we're doing a turnkey, even though you know, we're taking on most of the work, a lot of organizations, when they first start down this path, they don't necessarily even know how to evaluate uh, our offering. And that was kind of what started this SHRI program was, you know, let's increase the capacity of organizations to understand their different options to kind of, you know, so they can take it back to their boards, to their internal management and have, you know, really kind of great conversations and informed conversations on being able to compare the options. That capacity piece that we find is continually underestimated which is why it's really important to engage with, you know, either your developer partner or your, you know, your ecosystem, your municipal uh, administrators. There's a really rich ecosystem there to help you, but you do have to put aside the time to actually engage with them. Next slide, please. Okay, so I believe this is my last slide, and this is um, an example of a, a stacking example, and then I'll actually give you one other that I don't have a slide for. So this was our wood green project. I mentioned it briefly yesterday, and there was uh, three uh, three sources of capital. So, brief overview of the project: they were uh, wood green was mandated to get a handle on their long term liabilities. So they went there, uh, and also to understand their accessibility requirements and the investment needed. And so they undertook this evaluation of of all their buildings, building condition assessment, energy audits, accessibility audits, etc. And we developed a plan that included some energy related measures, some non energy related measures. And then we looked at the next 30 years of how to fund that plan and how to actually have the, you know, pay back the funders. So um, Wood Green had contributed uh, the project to $1.3 million uh, and efficiency capital. We were the kind of the equity in the project. Uh, Wood Green's 1.3 from reserves was actually set up as a loan. And then we also secured uh, the Better Buildings, the BBP uh, City of Toronto loan that I mentioned earlier. Uh, for those in the city, uh, not in the City of Toronto, in this case study, you could replace the City of Toronto loan with like a CMHC or FCM loan, uh, and it would have a similar impact. But the idea is that we were the main developer. We were able to lever leverage uh, Wood Green's 1.3 million into a contribution to a $3.4 million project. And then that could produce a series of benefits. It produced, uh, you know, almost $6 million in total savings. So operational savings, utilities, maintenance, et cetera. But it also produced a $6 million benefit to their reserves because we were able to, as I mentioned before, move around when capital expenditures uh, transpired and so that they didn't have to actually save as much. And, well, and then you can see in the graph is that so, you know, there was a, a stream of savings being produced, which was being measured over time. And most of those savings went to pay back efficiency capital and then the city of Toronto. Uh, year 10 efficiency capital, because that was the term of our money at the time, uh, you know, we drop off uh, and then all this, the savings are then split between Wood Green and the city of Toronto. And after year 20, it's all Wood Green. And Wood Green was actually able to set up their contribution from their reserves as a low interest loan. So it is actually getting paid back into their reserves at a, at a, at a nominal interest rate, which is, which is a fairly new approach as opposed to just spending the money on the capital uh, upgrades themselves. So a really good example of, of how you can work with a third party to bring this all together to stack certain funding. Uh, another example that I want to give you really, really quickly is I, I mentioned, um, you know, uh, I'll now imagine that you're a for-profit uh, apartment building owner that has small little apartment, uh, you don't have centralized uh, AC, something, uh, you know, that uh, Emma mentioned uh, in terms of comfortability of your tenants. So you have a really interesting opportunity. You could partner with an aggregator like Efficiency Capital, uh, who would come in and provide the equity 
who would uh, also, you know, facilitate the the cheap debt, like from Canada Infrastructure Bank, for example, and do the project. And when they do the project, though, um, in Ontario, to achieve, you know, 40% reduction of GHGs, chances are you're looking at a heat pump retrofit. So in a heat pump retrofit, 40% GHGs, you're getting, you know, the benefit of this, you know, third party equity and, and, and the, you know, long term, cheap, low carbon debt, you are now adding centralized cooling, which is much better than the, you know, plug in air conditioners that people have in their windows, much more comfortable, increases the value of those units themselves. Um, so you get the benefit of that. Uh, and at this point, you haven't really spent any money. Uh, but then additionally, you could, with the with the CMHC, um, uh, you know, MLI select um, a product, you can then also enjoy a cheaper mortgage payment. So you've managed to add cooling to your building, increase its value and reduce your mortgage payment, all having pay, uh, a third party, you know, developer and lender pay for it. Really, really powerful way to decarbonize and, and to still achieve you know, great balance sheet benefits. So those are just two different examples of how you could stack um, the, the, these kind of options together. It gets complicated evaluating the different um, options and how they kind of fit and how it, not only how they fit together by themselves, but how they fit in your capital plan and your financial the, you know, desires and outcomes. Um, so this is again why it's really important to start doing this, you know, financial planning and starting engaging with the financial ecosystem really, really early in your project. Just like it's important to engage with your tenants really early in the project. It's probably a repeating theme you've heard throughout uh, the last two days. Uh, thank you. I think uh, that's uh, the end of my presentation. I believe. Yep. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, um, and uh, you know, happy to set up a time to chat. So Matt, we have time for one or two questions that we can address in the session. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there are a few questions around the CIB program. Um, has CIB published a list of approved aggregators and how do you find a third party aggregator for the CIB program? Uh, yeah, so every, I believe it's every quarter or every, or semi-annually, they come out with a newsletter and they uh, update. Uh, they update who they've announced as aggregators. The program is still new, and uh, there's none of their aggregators um, have actually closed the deal yet. And but that we should be seeing that in the next few months. Uh, and uh, and we are also, you know, Efficiency Capital is quite aware of who the aggregators are. So you know, you can follow up with me, and we can have a, a little more detailed chat. Some of those details uh, in terms of the ones that weren't announced, we'd have to be under NDA. So that's why please reach out to chat. Um, but there are a number out there. And by the end of this year, you'll probably see it double. Great. Thank you. And the other question is, how was the future building value eval evaluated in your CSI example? So my understanding and um, there's actually, so CSI, if you go to their webpage, have some really, really great resources. It's kind of hidden in the resources because it was a while ago, but they have a whole guide on how to do community bonds and a whole case study of what they did. And there's really great details in there. So, you know, if you wanted to uh, crack that open, it's again, really great resource. Uh, my understanding there was that was your traditional valuation of net operating income uh, over uh, capitalization and, uh, or cap rate, I should say. And uh, so really just looking at the energy savings that um, they, uh, well, operational savings that they had planned that the retrofit, because uh, it wasn't just purchasing the building, they were also going to retrofit it. Um, and so they, the evaluation was based on post retrofit, whereas most lenders are just going to do the valuation based on, you know, what it is at the time. That's also another really great, um, now that rings a bell. It's also a really great aspect of the um, CMHC mortgage insur insurance product, the MLI Select. Uh, they will, um, they will, the mortgage that you take out that includes the financing of the retrofit will actually done on, be done on post retrofit um, valuation, even though you haven't done the retrofit and then you have a certain amount of time to accomplish.